Good day. My name is Tian Gildenhuis and on this video I would like to discuss a very important subject with you, namely contemplative prayer and mantras. Because this is also something creeping into the Church of Jesus Christ very subtly and Christians don't always discern what the Kingdom of Darkness is trying to do within the Church and we don't always know our scriptures as we know. So we have to compare the things happening out there and happening in the church with what the Word of God says so that we can see whether it is in line with the Word of God or not. But as it is always about our Lord Jesus Christ first, let us pray together first. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we glorify your name. Thank you, Lord. We know the Bible says where two or three are gathered in my name, I am in their midst. So, Lord, we know you're here. We'll be busy with the production of this video. But you will also be there where people will be watching this video, wherever they may be. And we pray that you alone will be glorified. We pray that your Holy Spirit will take me out of the way, that I will not be the one speaking, Lord, but that your Holy Spirit will speak in and through me, and that all our hearts will be willing to receive the truth of the Word of God. And thank you, Father, that you give us the authority to say to Satan, we bind your works now. You will not steal this message from the ears of the children of God and you will live in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, now we pray that you will set up your angels all around us, that you will cover us with your blood and that you yourself will be a wall of fire round about us according to Zechariah 2 verse 5 so that every place will be a safe place while we're busy. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Please take us by the hand and lead us now by your Holy Spirit. We ask it in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now all who know me know I always start with this verse in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 13, which reads, For we write none other things unto you than what ye read or acknowledge, and I trust ye shall acknowledge even to the end. And today on this video we will read what the Bible says regarding prayer, how we should pray, and what we should do when we pray. And you will see you can compare it to what people are being taught regarding the subject matter of this video. Because in Matthew 22 verse 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. And that is the problem with most of us today. We err, we make mistakes, we're being misled. Why? Because we do not know our scriptures. And why do we not know our scriptures, as I always say? because we do not know the author of the scriptures. And only when we get into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ himself and get baptized with his Holy Spirit, does he, through his Holy Spirit, reveal the truths of the word of God to us. And then we get to know the power of God in our personal lives and also the power of God to resist all these doctrines of devils that the Bible speaks about that is coming into the church in these end times. Now let us discuss what does the Bible say about prayer. And we read in Romans 12 verse 12, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. That means prayer is an ongoing thing in our lives. It's a daily thing. It is not just for certain times of the day. It is an ongoing thing. Continuing instant in prayer. And Ephesians 6 verse 18 says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So again, I do not only pray for myself, I pray always. And as somebody once said, I do not spend hours per day praying, but I don't let an hour pass by without praying. This is what it means, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit for all saints, not just for some people, for all saints. Because if I only do it for myself, then I am not obedient to the Word of God. Philippians 4 verse 6 says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. This tells me that prayer is a conversation with God. You can only make your requests made known unto God if you speak to God and let Him speak to you. Not just sit and wait in silence and clear your mind of everything around you. That is not what the Bible says. 
Colossians 4 verse 2 says, Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. So even while making my requests known to God, I already say thank you for the things that He blesses me with and wants to bless me with according to His word. My brother and sister, it's always about going back to the Bible and it must be in line with the word. Matthew 6 verse 5 and 6 says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. So again, you get these people going to these retreats and when they're among these, these groups of people, they pray and they go into this contemplative prayer and they're this wonderful group together. It's just wonderful fellowship and it is the corporate anointing they speak about and all that. My brother and sister of the Bible says, when you go into your closet, pray to your father, pray to meaning you speak out certain things. So you pray to the Father. You have a conversation with the Father. And then Matthew 6 verse 7 says, But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Vain repetitions. That is something that is called in the Eastern mysticism mantras. Mantras are used, and what is the meaning of mantras? It's originally in Hinduism and Buddhism. A word or sound repeated to aid concentration in meditation. A mantra is given to a trainee meditator when his teacher initiates him. This is where it comes from, the use of mantras, of using a certain word over and over and over again. Because they say to you, but this is the mantra that I give to you. This will be your mantra, this word or these two words. This is the word that you concentrate on and you speak this word over and over. That's Eastern meditation practices, my brother and sister. And a mantra is a sacred utterance. This is now all according to Wikipedia. A numinous sound, a syllable, word or phonemes, or group of words in Sanskrit, Pali and other languages, believed by practitioners to have religious, magical or spiritual powers. That is what a mantra is all about, using this one word or syllable or even just certain phonemes, which is just a, a sound that you use over and over and over and over, thereby thinking it is a sacred experience that you are having. It is not found in the Bible anywhere, my brother and sister, because we read in Luke 11, verse 1 and 2, and it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven. And we know the rest of the verses. But the thing is, what is Jesus now teaching his disciples? Is he teaching them a certain mantra, a single word, a single syllable, or just a sound to use over and over? No, no. He does not say to them, just be quiet and be silent and clear your mind of anything. He says, when you pray, say, speak things out. In other words, speak to the Father, converse with the Father. And then 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17 says, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing means pray without ceasing everywhere. Always, wherever you go, driving in your car, sitting at work, whatever you do, keep on praying. Be in a conversation with your Heavenly Father regarding the things going on around you and in your life in, in which you need help or wisdom or whatever the case may be. Pray without ceasing. And then 1 Timothy 2 verse 8 says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And my brother and sister, I also have a YouTube video on the praying hands symbol, or just it's, the title is the praying hands that you can go and watch for yourself. 
Because the Bible says here, I will therefore that men pray everywhere. Again, everywhere is everywhere. At home, while at work, while on the road. Pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. This is the way that we should pray. Not just going into a secluded spot and then saying nothing and clearing our mind of everything. But we will see where this practice comes from. Now, what is contemplative prayer? And I always give credit to all the authors whose work I use in my research. So you can see the links at the bottom of the specific pages, what the different authors wrote about these things. It is important to first define contemplative prayer. Contemplative prayer is not just contemplating while you pray. The Bible instructs us to pray with our minds. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 15 so clearly, prayer does involve contemplation. However, praying with your mind is not what contemplative prayer has come to mean. Contemplative prayer has slowly increased in practice and popularity along with the rise of the emerging church movement, a movement which embraces many unscriptural ideas and practices. Contemplative prayer is one such practice. And my brother and sister, the emerging church movement is a new age movement coming into the church of Jesus Christ. Contemplative prayer begins with centering prayer, a meditative practice where the practitioner focuses on a word and repeats that word over and over for the duration of the exercise. That is a mantra, my brother and sister. Whether you say the word Jesus over and over or love over and over, it is still a mantra. You are taught nowhere in the Bible to do it that way. But in the Eastern mysticisms, it is done that way. In the New Age, it is done that way. The purpose is to clear one's mind of outside concerns so that God's voice may be more easily heard. This is what these people teach other people. After the centering prayer, the practitioner is to sit still, listen for direct guidance from God and feel His presence. So it's all about your physical experience in this mystical situation that you find yourself in to feel God. My Bible says that faith is the substance of the things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So faith does not have anything to do with your senses, my brother and sister. Although this might sound like an innocent exercise, this type of prayer has no scriptural support whatsoever. In fact, it is just the opposite of how prayer is defined in the Bible. Then this author quotes Philippians 4 verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. These verses and others clearly portray prayer as being comprehensible communication with God, not an esoteric, mystical meditation. Contemplative prayer by design focuses on having a mystical experience with God. Mysticism, however, is purely subjective. So it's how I experience it. It's all about me, in other words, and does not rely upon truth or fact, because what I experience may not be the same that which you will experience in the same situation. Yet the word of God has been given to us for the very purpose of basing our faith and our lives on truth. What we know about God is based on fact trusting in experiential knowledge over the biblical record takes a person outside of the standard that is the Bible. Contemplative prayer is no different than the meditative exercises used in Eastern religions and New Age cults. But let us now look at some arguments in favor of contemplative prayer. There are many out there, but they basically come down to the same few things. Now, this ministry writes, There is nothing unbiblical or anti-Christian about solitude, silence, and contemplative prayer. Not at any rate as they have been practiced within the context of Christian history. As a matter of fact, these disciplines are part of time-honored tradition. Keep your eye on that word, tradition. It's not biblical, it's tradition. They've been central to the church's spiritual life for centuries. Again, central to the 
church's spiritual life, not according to the Bible necessarily. The fact, this is now what they say, the fact that an idea looks or sounds like New Age mysticism at first glance doesn't necessarily prove that it is New Age mysticism, they say. You have to dig deeper to get at the heart of the matter, and this is what we will do on this video. This is a case where the danger of jumping to unwarranted conclusions is very present and real indeed. Let's take a look at the scriptural evidence, they say. It was not in the wind, the earthquake or the fire that the Lord spoke to Elijah. It was in the still small voice of intimate personal communion, 1 Kings 19 verse 12. But again, God spoke to Elijah after Elijah spoke to God. He did not just become quiet and still and waited for a mystical experience. He was busy conversing with God in that time, in that verse. David highlights the value of this type of spiritual discipline in Psalm 4 verse 4, where he writes, Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. Another psalmist similarly represents the Lord as exhorting his people to be still and know that I am God, Psalm 46 verse 10. And that is actually the one verse that most of the contemplative prayer people use to try and justify using contemplative prayer, but we will come back to that verse. And Jesus himself, who lived and breathed the Old Testament scriptures, often retired to quiet, secluded spots in the wilderness or on the mountain where he could converse with his father again. But look at the word that they used themselves. He could converse with his father, not go into a mystical, esoterical experience with his father. He conversed with his father, yes. He had conversations with his father in prayer, yes. He obviously believed it was important to get away from the noise and distraction of the crowd. See Mark 1 verse 35. And in time, his disciples learned to follow his example. On the basis of this biblical foundation, these authors write, a strong tradition, look at that word again, of Christian contemplation and mysticism has grown up within the church over the past 2000 years. Again, did it come out of the Bible or did this tradition grow up in the church? Many of the early church fathers of the first three centuries of the Christian era, men like Gregory of Nyssa, who was a Roman Catholic saint, Gregory Nazianzus, who was a Roman Catholic saint, Basil of Caesarea, who was a Roman Catholic saint, John Chrysostom, who was a Roman Catholic saint, and Anthony of Egypt, who was a Roman Catholic saint, were contemplatives who had mystical experiences in prayer. This tradition has nothing to do with a depersonalizing, self-abnegating, nirvana-seeking spiritual practices of the Hindus, Buddhists, and New Agers. My brother and sister, I also have a YouTube video on Roman Catholicism versus the Bible that you can go and watch for yourself. Roman Catholicism does not follow the same Jesus Christ that you and I do. So if these people try to use Roman Catholic traditionalists as their source of contemplative prayer and they think that is in, according to the word of God, they are missing the point. Because in Mark 7 verse 9 to 13, we see what Jesus said about traditions. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. So Jesus Christ is not much in favor of different traditions, whether it was the Jewish traditions that he spoke about in Mark 7 or the Roman Catholic traditions or any other traditions which are not in line with the word of God because we are making the word of God of none effect through our traditions, also traditions regarding contemplative prayer that comes from Roman Catholic traditionalists believing that they are the source of these things and we can do what they did. But this ministry proceeds to say, it's even possible to trace this strain of spirituality to the apostles themselves. Peter, for example, saw visions on the roof of the house of Simon the Tanner, Acts 10 verse 9 to 16. Paul speaks of having been caught up to the third heaven, where he 
heard inexpressible words which it is not lawful for a man to utter, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 2 to 4, but nowhere in the Bible does it say he was busy praying and having a mystical experience. He was just caught up into the third heaven by God himself. Then there's John, whose encounter with the risen Christ while in the Spirit on the Lord's day gave us the book of Revelation, Revelation 1 verse 9. Then look at this, what they are saying here, because we must discuss this point later on in this video. In our view, it's not the form or style of such experiences that determine their legitimacy. Neither should we place too much emphasis on the methods or techniques of prayer that precede them. What counts is their content and the degree to which they either do or do not bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. I am sorry, but I differ from them regarding this, because this means we can use any kind of pagan uh, mysticism and then say, okay, but God doesn't mind whether we use the things of the devil to worship him. No, I'm sorry, God minds. And that is why we read in Exodus 23 verse 24, Thou shalt not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do after their works. We cannot do what the Roman Catholic mysticists and the Eastern mysticists did in Hinduism or in Buddhism and say God won't mind. God says you will not bow down to their gods, you will not serve them, and you will not do after their works. And you know, Jeremiah 10 verse 2, God also says, do not learn the way of the heathen. But by contemplative prayer, we are learning the way of the heathen, as I will show you. And Dr. Kathy Burns wrote in one of her books, we cannot Christianize pagan practices, even though the church so regularly tries to do by Christianizing pagan practices. We cannot do that, my brother and sister. God has never changed his mind. He hates idolatry. Now let us look at the true dangers of contemplative prayer. My brother and sister, there is more than enough information available out there that proves these things over and over and over. And you will see the authors whose work I use, they say the same thing over and over again. And I agree with what they say. This is why I use their material regarding this subject in this video. This author writes, If Satan cannot keep us from getting earnest about prayer, he will try to get us off on rabbit trails, or worse, spurious prayer. That's what contemplative prayer, hereafter referred to as CP, is. It sounds so spiritual. Shouldn't we contemplate God when we pray? Yes. Isn't contemplation the same as meditation? No. The problem with contemplative prayer, or listening prayer, or centering prayer, is that it is actually rooted in experience, in subjectivism, rather than in the Bible, God's objective revelation. Although we might learn some characteristics about God when we experience the world around us, it is known as general revelation, only in the scriptures, which is special revelation, do we have a reliable guide to encounter God and experience salvation. Profound mystical silence is not prayer. The endless repetition of a prayer word is not prayer. Getting one's mind in neutral so that the mystical presence of God can be experienced is not prayer. It is Christian yoga which is not Christian at all. And my brother and sister, I also have a whole YouTube video on Is Yoga Safe for Christians? Which you can also go and watch, on which I give much more information regarding the origins of yoga and what that is all about and what that causes in the lives of Christians. This author proceeds to write, A key verse in the Bible that is twisted to teach contemplative prayer is Psalm 46 verse 10, as I said earlier. Be still and know that I am God. According to CP, this verse teaches that one must get totally silent, quiet and still before the Lord, or he cannot hear God. One popular advocate for CP has actually said, silence is the language of God. That simply is not true. This is a dangerous perversion of this verse. The Hebrew word for still is rafa, 
which means slacken, cease or abate. The preceding verses describe the din of warfare, the raging of the heathen, the desolation of war and the dramatic intervention of God. Such commotion is likely to have the effect upon men of inducing stress and causing them to get in a dither. But God says, slow down and trust me, relax and watch God work. That is what it means to say, be still and know that I am God. But you see, this brought a false humility in people to say, but you know, I am still now. I'm such a humble person sitting in a corner and just contemplating God. This false humility really appealed to the Roman Catholic monks of the Middle Ages. Their attitude was, let's retreat to a cave somewhere and contemplate our navels for the rest of our lives. Not surprisingly, the guiding lights and spiritual authorities of the modern revival of mysticism, known under the new mantra of contemplative prayer, are the Catholic Desert Fathers, which I referred to a little earlier. Beware of mysticism. You ask, what is that? This is now John MacArthur speaking here. Mysticism is the idea that direct knowledge of God is achieved through personal, subjective intuition or experience apart from or even in opposition to historical fact or objective divine revelation. And where do we find that objective divine revelation? In the Bible. Any influence that encourages you to let yourself go or put your mind in neutral when you pray so that you can really pray in the Spirit comes from the unholy spirit, Satan. Fill your mind and heart with God's word. Let that word abide in you and inform your praying. Then pour out your heart to him in sincere, natural supplication. The word supplication also means petition. Let your requests be made known unto God about everything. Don't check your brains in at the door of your prayer closet. God wants you to use them. He is the one who gave you a mind and promises to renew it daily through the scriptures. But in that conviction, let us not be deceived by the pious terminology and sensational claims of the many voices endorsing contemplative prayer. Because unfortunately, there are many evangelical churches now endorsing this thing, saying, but this is the real way. This is the way to experience God, etc. But they are opening the door to demonic spirits. This author writes, one of the continuing snares Christians often encounter in their churches of almost every denomination is contemplative prayer. Is it biblical? Why are so many discernment ministries sounding the alarm? And as I said, there are many ministries out there sounding the alarm. And now I include this little video of mine as well. We are sounding the alarm, my brother and sister. And after having watched this or having read the material of other discerning ministries, you must make a decision before God whether you can proceed with this practice in your life. After all, doesn't the Bible say we are to meditate on God's word? The answer to that last question is yes. We are to fill our minds with scripture and think on those verses night and day or as often as possible. The problem with contemplative prayer is its mystical, eastern, non-Christian roots and its mind-emptying techniques. And these techniques include entering the silence, as some people call it, breath prayers, as some other ministries call it, chanting mantras, etc., etc. There are so many things they call the centering and, you know, entering the silence, breath prayers, focusing the inner man, etc., etc. Spiritual formation. Now, spiritual formation is this whole movement of trying to get people to have these mystical experiences with God. Now, spiritual formation seeks to lure evangelicals into ancient Catholic and Orthodox contemplative practices in order to draw closer to God, experience His presence, and hear His voice, now this is the dangerous part, apart from Scripture.
in order to embrace this mystical form of spirituality, contemplatives are willing to compromise at virtually every turn. What are they compromising? The Word of God. Central doctrines such as Sola Fide and Sola Scriptura are shrugged off as secondary. Methods never found in the Bible as the true means of spiritual growth and of knowing God are emphasized. You see, it's all about the methods and the techniques that you must use to practice the presence of God instead of just doing what the Bible says you must do. And complete heretics such as Thomas Merton, who was also a Roman Catholic priest, are seen as reliable spiritual guides to spirituality. The contemplatives have sold out to Catholic mysticism and abandoned the clear teaching of Scripture. Sadly, in the process, many undiscerning evangelicals will follow suit. Because, you know, this person, he knows God, or she knows God, and she's been doing this for so many years. So why can't I do this? And people are being pulled into this mysticism. This lady writes, I grew up in a very liberal church, that is a church devoid of the true gospel, in which contemplative prayer practices were recommended routinely for those who came seeking help with a stale prayer life. After I left the church as a young woman and went into the new age, these mystical practices were also an enormous part of my newfound spirituality. So when she left the church, where they had been doing contemplative prayer, she found the same thing in the new age and kept on doing that, but thought it was a new spirituality. And when God saved me at 35, I repented of these practices and recognized them for what they were, a satanic counterfeit designed to trick non-believers through whipped up mystical experiences into thinking they were experiencing God. But you see, they weren't. They were experiencing demonic beings trying to transform themselves and to appear as ministers of righteousness, according to 2 Corinthians 11 verse 14 and 15, which says that Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. But sadly, it wasn't long before these practices began flowing into what had once been solid evangelical churches, including my own precious church where I was saved. So she was in a church which used these contemplative prayers, but which was not really uh, a church having the true gospel because they were a very liberal church. And then that caused her to fall into the new age. And then she got saved in a true Bible believing church, which was then also infiltrated by these practices. This author refers to a retreat on which his wife went. During my wife's contemplative prayer session at the women's retreat, the leader said things like, Relax. Clear your spirit. Stay in the position you are in. Relax. Jesus, I am your God. Follow the light. There is a light. Follow it. Imagine. Visualize. Etc. The leader talked with a monotone, ethereal voice, slow and with many pauses. Some women started crying. The session ended with calling the women back with words like, Now come back. You can open your eyes. Anyone who wanted to be prayed for could stay behind. Apparently, no one asked for prayer. Afterwards, someone said, Oh, this looks like hypnotism. Another one said, It looks like it, hypnotism. If someone came in the church, they would not think this is a church. So this author proceeds to write, so the best way to hear from God is to hear from God personally, right? No, wrong. At best, we hear ourselves during contemplative prayer, but at worst, we hear from deceiving spirits, demons, or even from the devil himself. God speaks loud and clear to us through the Bible. Through the authority of the Bible text, we have clear guidance to authenticate his voice. If it's in line with biblical teaching, it's good. If it's not in line with biblical teaching, it's wrong. Simple and straightforward. And again, he says here, at best, we hear ourselves during contemplative prayer. I also have a YouTube video on our thoughts and the Bible in which I explain that we actually cannot generate our own thoughts. Our thoughts come either from God or from the devil. So if it's not from God, it is from the devil. These demons and deceiving spirits that this author refers to. 
He proceeds to say, The Achilles heel of contemplative prayer is the lack of sound biblical support. Jesus never taught contemplative prayer and neither did any of the apostles. That should be reason enough to stay away from contemplative prayer. The only way to draw near to God is through Jesus Christ who died and rose again. If we really want to be closer to God, let's follow the guidelines that Jesus Christ gave us in John 14 verse 21 and 23. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. By actively promoting contemplative prayer, people are being led into God-forbidden and even downright dangerous exploration of the spiritual realm. Rather than searching for the hidden mysteries of God and for the personal messages that God allegedly wants to convey to us, we should focus on what God has revealed to us in His Word. Remember Deuteronomy 29 verse 29? The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed, revealed where? In the Scriptures, belong to us and to our children forever. Why? So that we may follow all the words of this law. And so many people say, but I want a supernatural experience with God. Read His Bible. And He will reveal Himself to you in wonderful ways. But we must understand, Satan also brings supernatural experiences to people. Because I always say, Satan is a showman. He wants to pull people into his realm with all his supernatural experiences that he gives to people. God says, believe me, and I will show you from my scripture Satan says, now I will give you the powers, I will give you these experiences, and then you will follow me, because you will think I am an angel of light. This author writes the following, Please do not confuse my quiet time with contemplative prayer. There is a world of difference. Contemplative prayer, emphasizing silence, has roots that go back to the mystics of the medieval Roman Catholic Church, as we already said. The mystics were, in turn, profoundly influenced by New Platonism, a pagan mystical religion founded by Plotinus, a disciple of Plato. Although the word contemplative is by itself a positive word meaning thoughtful and reflective, contemplative prayer as taught by the mystics is entirely out of sync with what we know of Jesus and early Christianity. I am convinced that it is a hindrance rather than a help in nurturing a relationship with God. Here are three reasons, he says, I do not practice contemplative prayer. Reason number one, contemplative prayer is rooted in a pagan concept of God. Contemplative prayer began with Plotinus, AD 203 to 270, the founder of Neoplatonism, who transformed the philosophy of Plato into a religion. Plotinus taught that all reality had come from a supreme deity whom he called the One. This supreme deity, Plotinus taught, is impossible, meaning that he is unmoved by human experiences of joy, sadness or suffering. I do not practice contemplative prayer because it is a form of prayer rooted in a pagan, non-Christian concept of God, this author writes. Then reason number two, the revelation of God in scripture becomes secondary. Because the contemplative approach to prayer devalues human reason and language, its practitioners tend to neglect the concrete revelation of God in scripture. This in turn leaves them vulnerable to deceiving spirits and the angels of light of which Paul spoke in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 13 to 15. The goal of the person utilizing contemplative prayer methods is to have a mystical encounter with God. To facilitate such a mystical encounter, techniques and postures of prayer, breathing and meditation are very important. One striking example of this preoccupation with posture and technique is that of Gregory Palamas, a 13th century monk 
who stressed quietness and stillness in the pursuit of a mystical union with God. As an aid to concentration, he recommended that the chin rest on the chest with the eyes fixed on the navel. God, of course, looks on the heart, not the physical posture of the person who seeks him. Whether you are sitting upright, standing, lying down, lying in bed, prostrating yourself on the ground, sitting behind your car steering wheel, to God it's not about your physical posture while you're praying. This preoccupation with outward techniques and postures, staring at one's navel, takes the practitioner away from scripture. This is serious, for as the great historian Philip Schaff said, Every true progress in church history is conditioned by a new and deeper study of the scriptures, not by having uh, mystical experiences with God. I do not practice contemplative prayer, this author says, because it tends to lead those who practice it away from the Bible into an unhealthy introversion and self-serving pursuit of personal experience. Again, so it's all about me and what I experienced and my experience was deeper than yours. So again, it becomes pride as well. Reason number three, Jesus and the early church did not practice or teach it. Jesus does not advocate any form of mystical or contemplative prayer. He does not teach any postures or techniques for prayer and meditation. Neither is there any mention of silence or centering prayers. Instead, he emphasizes a relational approach, being in a relationship with God, in other words, in which prayer is simple conversation with a loving, benevolent being whom he calls Abba, an endearing term used only by children for the Father in the Jewish household. For Jesus, oneness with God is not a mystical union of one's being with God, but a practical oneness of will and purpose. Not my will, but yours be done. Luke 22 verse 42 b. Jesus prayed, showing that in his incarnate state, union with God consisted of a submission of his will to the will of the Father. When the disciples in Luke 11 verse 1 to 4 asked Jesus to teach us to pray, he does not respond by teaching them techniques and postures for prayer and meditation. Instead, he says to them, When you pray, say, Our Father who art in heaven. Jesus teaches them to verbally express themselves to God in prayer. For Jesus, prayer is relational and is characterized by intelligent conversation with a personal heavenly father, not a mystical experience with some being which you are not sure that it is God, because it might be the devil himself, it might be a demonic entity. The early church followed in the footsteps of Jesus and prayed dynamic relational prayers in which they recognized God's majesty and greatness and asked for his help in the urgencies of life. You can go and read Acts 4 verse 23 to 31. The miracles they experienced, now look at what this author says here, because this is a very important point. The miracles they experienced, healings, angelic deliverances, and so on, occurred not in a mystical, contemplative state of prayer, but while they were going about the business of obeying Christ's command to take the gospel to the whole world. They did not have any mystical experiences alone in a corner in the darkness. They had these things happen to them while they were busy proclaiming the word of God, preaching to people, praying for the sick, healing the sick, raising the dead, etc. It happened while they were busy doing their normal day-to-day -day things. The author proceeds to write, I cannot imagine Jesus and his disciples all sitting in the lotus position with their eyes closed seeking to go into a place of silence and contemplation where they would ascend heavenward into a mystical encounter with God. Such a picture is completely contrary to what we know of Jesus from the Gospels. Instead, he promises his followers a baptism in the Holy Spirit that will empower them to be his witnesses from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. 
their encounter with God on the day of Pentecost does not cause them to withdraw from the world into silence, like the Roman Catholic priests and monks try to do, but compels them to go forth into all the world, declaring the good news of what Jesus has done for the human race. This other author writes, Contemplative prayer is based in spiritual formation. It teaches the use of spiritual directors, and it teaches that we need to center ourselves in prayer. These terms and phrases are found nowhere in the Bible, nor do they have any biblical basis. Some who advocate the use of contemplative prayer use Psalm 46 verse 10, where it speaks of being still before God to justify this practice. In context, the command to be still has nothing to do with letting go of our thoughts and feelings for the sake of some mystical experience with God. It speaks of trusting God even when the difficulties and troubles of life come. The Bible consistently teaches that we are to meditate upon God's word, a process in which the mind is active and engaged. Joshua 1 verse 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have some good success. Thus, the purpose of meditation is to know God by His Word, so that we are careful to live in a way that honors Him. Meditation is not for the purpose of achieving some extra spiritual oneness or closeness to God, as if we can take our Christian faith deeper through means other than trusting and obeying God's word. Spiritual formation presents itself as being something that Christians used to do, but they say it is only since we have become more cross-cultural and have recovered our history that we are finally learning what Christians used to do. Now, my brother and sister, the author lies in exactly in what they're saying there. Since we became more cross-cultural, so yes, because then we started to pull in the Eastern mysticism practices into the church. And recovering our history means people are starting to go back under the Roman Catholic mysticisms and Roman Catholic mystics and starting to do what they did. It's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible must be our guide. And it contains nothing that teaches Christians to try to attain some mystical experience of silence. Those who advocate contemplative prayer promote the use of spiritual directors. You see, they are these people who are directing the trainees to teach them how they should do this. So they promote the use of spiritual directors who are supposed to hear the Holy Spirit's personal voice in response to the life stories expressed by the directees. Their purpose and goal is to lead these vulnerable ones to some newer level of freedom and closeness with Christ a job, the Bible says, belongs strictly to the Holy Spirit himself. John 16 verse 13 says, The Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. No spiritual person, no spiritual director. Don't put your trust in man. Because Jeremiah 17 verse 5 says, Cursed is the man that puts his trust in man. Being guided by the word of God does not mean that we are to repeat single words and short phrases thinking on them over and over again until we are no longer conscious that we are thinking at all. This is called using mantras, a distinctly pagan practice for the purpose of losing thoughts and feelings. Yet this is the driving force of spiritual formation and contemplative prayer. The teaching is to be so close to God that you just commune with him rather than communicate with him. In other words, they believe that God's presence is experienced most deeply without the mind and the emotions. Prayingchurch.com of the ELCA says this, Respond to God's presence with an act of faith. Do not allow your thoughts or feelings to get in the way. 
However, the Bible teaches that losing our thoughts and feelings is not necessary for faith to be exercised. Faith requires an active mind and will to obey and believe. Again, quoting from PrayingChurch.com When thoughts come into your mind, gently let go of them and focus on a single word such as Jesus, Lord, Love, some say light or whatever. And again, center your attention and desire on God. Leave your thoughts and feelings peacefully. Nowhere in the Bible does it say to abandon thoughts and feelings. Rather, it says to think on what is good, right, pure and noble, Philippians 4 verse 8. It says to take wrong thoughts captive, which only an active, engaged mind could do, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5. It does not say to stop thinking and feeling. This is akin to pagan Eastern religions such as Buddhism, where one must lose his or her state of consciousness in order to find God and be one with God. Buddhism calls this altered state of consciousness of mind-emptying oneness Om, and actually so does Hinduism as well. Contemplatives call it the deeper Christian life. Both use mantras. Both advocate this mystical silence and both speak of finding oneness within. A pattern does emerge and certainly it is not a biblical one because the Bible does not teach us to do these things. These are the counterfeits that Satan brought into the church via Eastern mysticism, Roman Catholic mysticism and the New Age. May we not fall prey to this deception which is centuries old, of tricking us into thinking that there is a deeper life besides enjoying God and knowing Him by His Word. We don't have to go out to the desert or to some mountain in order to hear God. As we pour out the burdens and longings of our hearts toward God, wherever we are, He will point us to scriptures that will teach us and guide us. The more scripture we know and have read, studied and meditated upon, the easier it will be for us to grow in Christ. God is everywhere and He is in the hearts of His church. We do not need a spiritual director, for we have the Holy Spirit of God to lead us and give us the words to say. Romans 8 verse 26 to 28. We don't need mantras because we have the word of God. We don't need to find some deeper Christian life, for we only need to believe the word of God more as we rest in our God who we believe is faithful. You see, when you study your scriptures and you are in a personal relationship with God, He through His Holy Spirit leads you and you grow in a deeper Christian life without having any mystical experiences. God doesn't want us to imagine ourselves in some biblical story because this is also what these contemplative prayer advocates do sometimes to let you imagine yourself being part of a certain biblical story. He wants us to study the Bible and draw principles from it to apply to our lives. He doesn't want us to read a passage and then think about what it means to us he wants us to discern what it means to Him and then make the resultant changes and applications in our own lives. So if we are not in line with His scripture, we must make the changes and applications in our lives. The bottom line is this. The deeper life is not in us. Prayingchurch.com has it wrong. Enjoy your own inner silence. Be calm. The Lord lives in the midst of your silence. The Lord doesn't live in my silence or your silence. Plain and simply, the Lord lives. We grow not by going into ourselves, but by being found in Him. Galatians 2 verse 20 says, I live no more, yet Christ lives within me. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who gave Himself for me. So we grow not by going into ourselves, but by being found in Him and letting Him have control of our active and conscious mind, will and emotions. The Bible also actually says we have the mind of Christ. And so 
we must use our mind in an active conscious way. Going into ourselves doesn't lead us to God. Yielding ourselves in faith to God is what enables us to grow. We are not to go into ourselves and find an altered state of being and mind, but we are to actively reflect upon God's word, because then we will grow, my brother and sister. And that is why we find the warning in Luke 6 verse 46, where Jesus says, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? My brother and sister, you know what? We are very gullible beings, and that is why we need the Word of God in our lives. We need to always go back to what the Bible teaches. And the Bible teaches us, as I've shown you today, what we should do, how we should pray. I also actually have another YouTube video on our model prayer, the Our Father, where Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, including us, the Our Father, and what it all encompasses and what it all means, how we should pray. But I've also given you some more verses today. But I've now also shown you what the origins are of contemplative prayer, of centering prayer, of breath prayers, and all these things. It is not biblical. It comes from the kingdom of darkness. It has now suddenly entered the church, and now many Christians think it is Christian. No, it is not Christian, my brother and sister. Please beware. Even with this little video of mine, I've now warned you. I've given you a piece of the puzzle that God has given me. And I've warned you about this, what you now choose to do with this knowledge, after having received this knowledge, is now between you and the Lord. I can only pray that the Holy Spirit will convict you to get out of those practices and get to a place of having conversations with God on a daily basis, everywhere you go, in whatever you may busy, be busy doing, so that He can be glorified in your life and you will experience wonderful times with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Because remember one thing, He is not a dead God. He's not just this mystical being somewhere in heaven. He is a living Father. He's a living God. Jesus Christ Himself says in Revelation 1, verse 17 and 18, I am the first and the last. I am He that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And all honor and glory goes to Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So let us pray together. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we glorify your name, Lord. Thank you that you teach us through your scripture to stand on the word of God and not be misled or be pulled away by the doctrines of devils in these subtle little things coming in from Eastern mysticism and Roman Catholic mysticism, uh, just covering itself under Christian veneer. But Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will take this knowledge that I've now shared with my brothers and sisters and just break it open in their hearts. And if some of them have been caught in these practices, I pray that your Holy Spirit will convict them and that they will get out of those practices, not be pulled into those things anymore, but that they will then really start to grow in their relationship with you by studying their scriptures and starting to do what the Bible says and living according to your word so that you can be glorified. And Lord Jesus, we know your coming is very close at hand. And that is why we keep on crying out, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. For the Spirit and the Bride say, come Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, Amen. And you